what do CEOs need to know about sales these days? A lot. Outdated sales strategies and tactics plague most companies today. Listen to what innovative CEOs and experts have to say about how to change all that with Sales Talk for CEOs. Occasionally, I like to bring back some of my favorite episodes. This was a fun episode that made a big impact because the CEO had some secrets to share along with her highs and lows. Kate Bradley Chernus, CEO of Lately, fondly known as Kate Lee, the rock star DJ turned into marketing maverick, who along with her team is revolutionizing the way we connect with our audience. Lately is an AI powered writing model that creates powerful content snippets in your own voice that get your audiences engaged, excited, and ready to take action. But don't be fooled by all the success. Kate will be the first to tell you that this roller coaster ride we call entrepreneurship is not all fun and games. From facing the highs and the terrifying lows of startup life to convincing her team to take a leap of faith, Kate's journey is a testament to the relentless passion and unshakable belief that drives every true entrepreneur. Enjoy this episode. Welcome, Kate, to Sales Talk for CEOs. I'm so glad to have you here. As I told you before we started, I've been such a fan of lately <laughs> and watching you guys. And I'm excited now to have you be here with all of us and tell the story of how you started lately and how you built your sales organization. So welcome. Thank you so much, Alice. It's amazing. Like, you know, just listening in the pre-show here, just talking about where we're from and and we're talking about women entrepreneurs and it's the struggle is so real. And so I'm so grateful because you're taking some time today to lift me up and I, I can't do it without you. So thank you. Well, I think it, that's such so important that you said that because like we were discussing before the show, we have to lift each other up, right? We just have the power to do it. And we need to use our power in these very positive ways uh, to support. And so I love that we're able to do that as well. But um, I want you to just start by telling us about Lately. What does Lately do? What problem does it solve? And who are you solving that problem for? Who's your target audience? Yes. Yeah, so Lately uses artificial intelligence to learn any brand voice. And then we build a uh, writing model based on the words that key phrases and the sentence structures that we know are going to get you the highest engagement, right? Because we're driven by connection and all sales are driven by connection. So that's where we focus. And then you can take long form content like a podcast like this or any video, any audio, any text at all. It could be a blog or a chapter of a book. You run it through the model and then instantly the AI will parse up say a video into a hundred snippets, all with like a headline that has the words that we know are going to work for you and the matching video clips. I mean, for me, this is just like, oh my gosh, the most amazing thing <laughs> because I know that as a, as a person in the industry who's trying to get some new ideas out there and help people think differently, I'm I have to write content. I have to write really good content, but then I have to repurpose, repurpose, repurpose. Yes. And it's so much work. And what you guys are doing is making it easier for me to get my message out. To, first of all, just to write it. Secondly, to repurpose it and, and really put it out through all the channels. You're just making it easy. Thanks so much. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because from our side, you know, we're, my special gift, Alice, is to see the glass half empty, <laughs> right? And so I'm constantly amazed that we even have customers, even though, we, you know, we have plenty of customers and, and that we exist at all because, you know, this ride is a ride and it is the roller coaster is the cliche that people use, but it is so true. And it's more it's not only the roller coaster, but I'm driving it right <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and <laughs> you get... and it's not always fun. Is no, it? it's not it's fun. Kind of yes. It's like you actually get to the top and you're like, woo, and then like you purposely jump off, you know, and, and it's, or another way people say is like, I get punched in the face every day, which is true. Ugh. Right. But I must love it. So there's, there's this, um, there's this manic -ness about being a startup entrepreneur where the high, you love the highs and you love the lows 
And you can only get those highs if you're willing to go down deep for the lows, right? Right. Well, and it's driven by that passion. And I think all good entrepreneurs, whether they can actually articulate this or not, they it comes from their heart, right? And that's where the passion comes from. And that's what gets you through the low times. It is. And helps you keep the lid on it in, in the really high times too. Yeah. And the team, right? I mean, you know, I'm really lucky that my team is willing to go, they, they bleed with me and, and not a lot of people are willing to do that. And let me just be clear. So people understand like my team, um, 95% of them didn't take a paycheck for two years. And wow. the last year, at least everyone on the team didn't pick, take a paycheck for at least one month. A lot of people half months, um, and it's, it's really, that's the most painful thing that I have to deal with. Like my personal level, uh, personal tolerance level for pain is very, very high. But when I have to ask other people to join me yeah. there, you know, it's really super tough. And, you know, I do a lot of, I learned it's called ex- internal marketing is the weird label, but I do a lot of internal marketing to make sure that they are willing <laughs> you know, and stay willing. And, you know, we obviously are checking ourselves constantly. What's the outdoor temperature? Do we have happy customers? Right. Yeah. And, right. and we're constantly checking our level of crazy. Like is what we're doing still worth <laughs> all of this pain? Yeah. We actually have all these, um, you know, proof points and that conflict though is constant because we might have a million proof points, but internally we'll have like, you know, cr- terrible things, terrible things happening, really terrible. And not just one, like five at the same time, you know? And so you're that, that ability to look up and just scan the horizon and be like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I guess we should keep going. Um, and, and especially, you know, we, I'm, we're seven years old, as we had talked about earlier, we've been in market for almost four years now. Um, and you had asked who our target audience is, and that has morphed over time, right? And, and some of it's because it just keeps coming to us a certain way, some of it because we've actually aimed a certain way. But what we've learned constantly is that that, that engagement piece we were touching on earlier, that connection is everything. And one thing that we've maintained, there's two things that we're really good at. My my superpower, Alice, is um, B2C connection, right? So I, do, do you know this? I'm not sure, but I, I used to be a rock and roll DJ. <laughs> oh my goodness. What a great reveal. I love it. A rock and roll DJ. Okay. Yeah. So my last gig was broadcasting to 20 million listeners a day for XM Satellite Radio. Nice. And I learned how to turn listeners into fans, like mm. customers into evangelists, because there's a big difference, yes. right? Evangelists market and sell for you, right? That's right. And so I, I know the value of that. So we, when we started lately, we began marketing very early because I know how long it takes to lay it out, right? You can't just you don't yeah. build it and they come. That does not happen, right? And it takes right. a lot of work and you're building this fan base so that um, in the last two and a half years, actually not a day has passed where someone has written about us spontaneously on social media in a wonderful way every single day, right? And we're small. That at. is, I mean, like, <laughs> let's pause there and celebrate that. Thank you. That is awesome. And that's, I think if more companies took the time, right, to get that set up in the beginning and to make sure that machine was working because there's nothing better than having everyone who buys from you out there telling everyone else to do the same, right? Yeah. And it's a combination, by the way, of the product being fun and amazing because it is. And also my, my team's customer service. You know, we go, that's a decision we made in the beginning as, as a small company, how can we win hands down? Right. And we know by being nice is the way to win because yeah. there's think about That's it like marketing. I mean, there's plenty of products that are crummy, but <laughs> they've broken through in other ways. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. And we even have customers who who are not customers anymore that still evangelize us. Right. And which is great because as we've morphed over time, a lot of them, we've been able to go back to them and, and resell them or um, at least redemo them and get feedback and, and maintain you know, a valuable relationship there. Yeah. So who is your ideal 
customer now. I mean, understanding that it's morphed. And of course it would over the seven years. We all start somewhere thinking something and then move, move to what would be even better. And I just was doing this exercise yesterday with a group of CEOs and saying, who is your ideal customer? And they'd, li- you know, give me a list of demographics and psychographics and we'd talk about it. And I'd be like, that's still so broad. Is that really ideal? I understand you may do business with those people, but is it ideal, right? Who is your ideal customer? So wh- who have you morphed over to and aimed right at now? Yeah. So in the beginning, we were 100% SMB and our mindset was like, if you can m- make it, and ship it on your own, shouldn't you be able to market on your own, right? So we were thinking about, um, you know, really micro entrepreneurs at the time. And the idea was to, so, so I built a, um, I used to own a marketing agency and I built a spreadsheet for Walmart that got them 130% ROI year over year for three years. So, wow. <laughs> so that was the idea was like, how do we take this spreadsheet system and make it so that anybody could walk in and, and, market themselves like the biggest retailer in the world, right? And when I had done the Walmart project, it was unique because it was Walmart and all their franchises and Bank of America and all theirs, AT&T and all of theirs, the IRS and United Way Worldwide and all of their constituents. So it was about 20,000 marketers, small, medium, and large, for-profit, nonprofit government. And what I learned, Alice, was that everybody had one really big problem, didn't matter if it was the largest retailer in the world or a library down the street, which is they hated writing. Right. Right. Writing was hard. And so when we set out, we had that in mind, but we weren't even focused there. We were thinking that my spreadsheet system was more of an organization tool. And as customers started using the products, we saw that organization, while valuable, was extremely unsexy and difficult to sell. But this writing component that we had people really liked that you know and we didn't know it was ai then even because that wasn't a thing you know and so we started to watch the customers and pay more and more attention and suddenly much larger companies came to us and were passing lately around internally to literally hundreds of employees and trying to figure out how they could individually use this where we'll, we were like trying to sell you know the cmos and we banged our head against the wall for a couple of years there because we we couldn't get the adoption. There was all this excitement, but we couldn't convert it into sales. And we couldn't get the higher ups to do it either. And, and there were lots of reasons why. I mean, timing and budgets and layoffs and, and a lot of stuff, people stealing our tech. I'm not kidding. That was fun. Um, but then <laughs> the real problem it it turns out that we've been studying over the last couple of years and and we found that this was the same for enterprise and small and medium business our our okay. so like we looked at the the successful cohorts that we had what what keeps them and all the people who churned what's keeping that what's losing them and we we're trying to look at patterns so we're studying pricing we're studying um KPIs like what do you need to do in the product to stick around how many posts do you need the AI to create for you do you need to actually publish those posts or just actually uh, have it ha- see them or actually edit them. W- what are all those little nuances? What kinds of customers are they? We had a we were mistaken for a long time, and we presumed that customers who churned weren't sophisticated enough as marketers oh. to understand the value of what we're doing, right? Because if somebody's asking you, well, why should I post more than once a day? You kind of want to, you know, smack your forehead a little bit, right? So, and and that was difficult because we kept running into another barrier, which was everybody constantly wanted marketing education, whether it was a small right. company, right? Or, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk's team asking me, how many times should I right. post today? I'm like, really? So, so that was interesting, but we didn't have the capacity to also be a marketing education platform. Okay. Right. And then we, this is all the stuff combined. So we couldn't sequence the product because everybody comes at marketing in a different um, right. order. So then we couldn't self-serve this product. So now we're giving demos to small businesses and large businesses, which is obviously not a great use of resources and time. And we're trying to figure out like, well, how do we scale this? You know? So the customer actually hasn't changed. It still is everyone, which every investor has told me until recently that I'm crazy and you can't do that. Right. However, I can do that 
because I can market to them all the same, which I have. So we use no cold calls, no cold emails, and no paid ads. We only use Lately, organic Lately, to market Lately. And we have a 98% sales conversion. Okay? Let me say that again. So you drink your own champagne. Some people like to say eat your own dog food, but you drink your own champagne. That's right. And that is proof. And that is so powerful. Yeah. I mean, so this is the one thing that that ain't broke, <laughs> right? We know that. And we've even understood that we can do um, sort of a morphed version of quote account-based marketing, meaning we can take pillars of content that we create on a theme and then re recreate the same content but use keywords around specific industries, right? So we've been seeing that that works for us as well. And it just falls. So what I do is I do a lot of speaking engagements. This is our, I'll tell everybody the method so that they can copy it. Cause you can do it by hand if you want to, it's the hard way. Um, but you, so I do a public and speaking engagement every day, or I try to get, I read a blog, something like that. And we, you, yeah, I noticed cause I went on your LinkedIn this morning, right before we talked yeah, and I saw that you're speaking in Boston, well, online and you're speaking about writing. Right. And yeah. I think you use the word poopa loopa. A poop -a -loopa. <laughs> I try to be, you know, engaging, right? <laughs> I loved it. I was like, oh, that's perfect. But just to pause on that for a second, the truth is that we are not learning how to write. Right. And I made a comment on your post about it because I do teach at the university and I teach in the entrepreneurship minor and I teach sales in the entrepreneurship minor. Mm. And, you know, sales and marketing today have really merged together, you know, in a way that, probably people never thought it would, but because of social media, salespeople have become their own marketers. You know, before email, it was basically pick up the phone, go to a show, stop in, right? All right, all of that in the old days when I was young and we were selling. But now the salespeople have their own tools at hand to do marketing with. The problem is they don't know how to do marketing, but they're trying to do marketing. And so because they don't know how to write in a way that is engaging, that comes from the customer's point of view right. and gets the customer intrigued. They don't know how to do any of that. So they do this really bad writing that you were talking about in the post. Yep. And then people just delete and it really hurts your brand because it's like, why would I buy from you? Well, the worst one is we're a lead generation company. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, I would never let you send those emails to my customers. So it is a huge problem that people do not know how to write. And that is why I think, you know, where investors and myself as uh, you know, as a sales strategist would always say, narrow your focus, narrow yes. your focus. Who are you selling to? Um, what are the demographics of those companies? What are the psychographics? Be very narrow. In most cases, that will win over, you know, we sell to everyone. But I think in your case, your ideal customer what they have in common is not their size or their or where they are geographically or how many employees they have or any of those things. Right. What they're, they're having in common is they have this very specific problem they're trying to solve around having a bunch of people writing poop -a loop -a content, <laughs> <laughs> really bad content, and pushing it out and ruining their brand. Literally, like, that's right. Damaging Just get it brand. done. Get it out the door, right? You know, get it out. The, and it's terrible. So it is a, it's a problem that large or small. Many salespeople are few, many marketers are few, you know, many customer success or few, you need them all to write in a way that engages the customer and intrigues them and they don't know how to do it. So yeah. that's your common theme and that's your target audience. Anyone who needs to write content that intrigues people and engages them because what all salespeople want right now today and or customer success they want to talk to customers right. and they're not having the opportunity to do it. Yeah. I think because know, they don't engage. Them. I was just reading, um, I was reading um, copy from a competitor today um, who focuses on paid ads and their line was the right words that sell. And I thought, well, what's different about what we're doing? And, and I thought they're missing the mark because the objective actually isn't a sale. Right. <laughs> right. The objective is first engage. 
get them right. to react to you. It get get their number, right? As they right. say, like it's like a dating experience, you know? Right. Um, get to the next step. Get the reaction. Get people to lean in. Get that long play going. Curiosity, right? This is what I'm trying to help salespeople understand. Yep. It's that you need to get them to be curious enough to want to talk to you and learn more. And if you're not giving them a message that intrigues that, you know, piques their curiosity, you're not trying to sell them anything other than to talk to you. That's it. That's because it. I don't even know if you need what I have or whether you'd be a good fit for my company. I just need you to be curious enough to have a conversation with me. And we are just blowing it. Yeah, we're blowing it. And the thing that you're saying about the curiosity is because that, what that does is it puts some of the weight on the person who's being on the customer, on the target, right? And then they're participating in the sale. And so I always think about, I always go back to music. So when um, somebody comes and and shows you a record and, and you're like, oh my God, I love this record. When you then share that record with your friend, you get the credit for being the tastemaker. That's right. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a, it's, it's so much more powerful, obviously, when the customer is leaning in, you have to work less harder at the sale and they're not going to churn is the other thing. They're going to, and then they're going to evangelize you. So it's like a win, 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 you know? So absolutely. Absolutely. So you sell to companies that have a B2B sale, business to business or a B2C business to consumer. It doesn't matter because all of them need the language and the way to get the language out. Exactly. And the thing that we learned as a company in the last year, especially it was so interesting, was that the mistakes that we have made, and you know, there's a, there's a million and they're pa- very painful. Um, and I'll share one just to make everybody feel better. So I grew the company 240% <laughs> over COVID, yay for me. But I also, wow, yeah, but I also, and that's an MRR. I also uncovered a $240,000 accounting error. <sighs> mm-hmm. Right. And guess what? Other companies have had it way worse. <laughs> so all I could do was cry for a second, lift my head up and like, be like, okay, F let's move on, you know? But, right. but part of that learning, which got us here was that our larger customers, if we just started treating and we had this idea before and we thought we were doing it, but, but we weren't, if we just started treating them as individuals, yeah. <laughs> Human beings. Yes. Mm. Right. Yeah. And stop trying to sell to the marketing teams or the sales teams, right. but sell to the individuals right. and then make the product. Um, the other thing we, we decided to do, Alice, is we've been, you know, it, it's hard not to listen to all the noise. Right. And especially when you're a woman, everybody wants to give you advice. Yeah. Kill me oh, now. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, everybody's hot, hot to tell you um, all the things you can't do by yourself of course. Right. And, you know, it's really, sometimes you believe them. It just happens. And, um, you know, I had people saying to me, you can't possibly be a category creator. You have to have competitors. And I kept saying, no, we don't, we're doing something new This was for seven years ago, you know, and and, until recently. And then, um, I met a entrepreneur. It was Mark Roberts from, so he's the, you know him? He's, I know Mark. Okay. Yeah. So Mark is amazing. He's for everyone who doesn't know, he's the CRO that took HubSpot to IPO and he coached us this summer. And he was like, why are you guys positioning yourselves as a category disruptor in the social media management platform when you're a, a category creator? And I was like, well, because everyone has yes. told me that I can't possibly be. And he's like, that's because they've never seen it before. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> This is why we have to really believe in ourselves. Yeah. And I think it's hard sometimes, like you said, people tell you you can't do it and you start to believe them for some crazy reason. And that's part of what you said earlier, checking you're crazy every once in a while. <laughs> like, is it me? Am I crazy or are they crazy? Right. Because I think it's them because we are creating creating a category and we are doing it very deliberately, which is, you know, that's what you're doing and really important. So, okay. So right now then who you're aiming at, who your target audience is, is people who have this problem to solve, whether it's B2B or B2C, they need to write engaging content that piques curiosity and gets conversations started. And then they need to get it out in the right places, right? Where their tribe is watching them. Take us back to 
what you were doing. I mean, you, you were a DJ, you're a marketer, you've done some amazing things, but right before you started this company, like with your co-founders, we all just sitting around drinking one night and went, Oh man, we just started a company. Like what happened? What was the impetus to, to start this company? And what were you doing right before you started it? Yeah. So my friend, Steve, so I had my marketing agency. I'd left the music industry. Um, my dad was an inspiration. He actually shook me lovingly by the shoulders one day and said, you can't work for other people and there's no shame in that, mm. you know, which is pretty eye awakening at the time. And so I, I started a couple companies and I, then I had the, the agency and my friend Steve is from the tech world and he had, he'd had a successful exit. He was a former CTO and he kept kind of harassing me over the course of a year. He wanted to see all my spreadsheets, you know, and he was like, you know, we just need $25,000 and we can make some wireframes and we'll automate your spreadsheets. And Alice, these were all words I had never heard before. Right. Right. Wireframe automate, you know, because he knew a world I didn't know. And $25,000, I've, I've been eating ramen for years in radio. Right. Thought, like, well, are you kidding me? I'm from the starving music industry. <laughs> I'm a starving musician. Have you met me? I was like, you're crazy. And so he ended up taking the money out of his own pocket and bringing in Jason, who's another one of my co-founders, who single-handedly designed products for both Target and Bank of America. He's a superhuman. And we had a million things in common. And so they came over on a Sunday uh, after Christmas at eight o'clock at night, which was very inconvenient for me. I was pissed off and I had a couple glasses of wine <laughs> <laughs> and they showed me what they made and I got it. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. And I remember saying to Steve, <clears throat> he's like, are you ready? You want to do this? And he knew this. He knew about the fundraising. He knew all these things, you know, that I had no idea of. But you had no idea, right? Yeah. Because he'd been there and done that. And I was like, the only thing is I have to be the boss. And he was like, don't worry. I don't want anything to do with this. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for being brave enough to say I got to be the boss. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I sometimes I tease him and say it's all it's all your fault because, you know, this is quite a ride. And, um, and it wasn't easy. Even then, you know, the, our first year, Alice, we... So Jason and I went out and we raised $250,000 that summer. Um, mostly, I, I ended up looking at my network and somebody had some great advice for me. They said, look at the patterns of people in your network. And my first instinct was it's all music people, but actually it, mm. it wasn't. And I started to look at what those, the, all the people had in common and, or yeah. different or whatever. And it turns out that I had a more wealthy network than I thought. Um, and so we raised that money and then... We brought in a CTO um, who was not a co-founder, and it turns out he had a raging alcohol problem and wasted oh. $100,000, and I had no product to speak of. And then um. I, won a, I, won a, I won a pitch competition, or I, I came in like fourth or fifth out of 100 people, so that was great. Wow, that was still really good. It was great, <laughs> yeah, um, especially because the people in charge were now I know who they are. They were doing everything in their power to squash me. You know, they're blacklisted in my book now, but because I can see, you know, all the things. Um, but anyways, and then we got into an accelerator and we had another CTO who we lost to depression. So like we had this like terrible curse on us. And then finally we met Brian, who's my now co-founder and CTO, who's an incredible human. And, you know, we were off to the races, so to speak. And, but that was just, you know, one of the many peaks and valleys, like from there, it's certainly been. No. So Steve Crazy. saw something and, and good for him. Yeah. So you, you moved from music. And I think the, the cool thing about knowing that you were in music is that you just have that really creative edge, right? You live in that world of creating and changing and molding. Cause that's what music is all about. Right. And also getting people to listen that that's another thing that music is about. So you had all that background. Did you have formal education in marketing at all? Or did you just dive into marketing? I'm curious. I was a, f so I was a fiction writing major. So I had writing background okay. and I'd written hundreds of commercials in radio. I became the, the production director oh. wherever I was. Okay. Now this is money. making sense. Yeah. Like, the, so you were, pra because yes, the DJing wasn't necessarily making the money, but the writing, the commercials. And so you learned how to write that language that would draw people in. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And I obviously I had, you know, I was really lucky, Alice, because I grew up in radio that doesn't exist anymore. It was live. 
<laughs> right. It was live radio. It was creative radio. So it was a, adult album, <clears throat> excuse me, alternative, which is uh, the kind of radio that plays album, rock, folk, blues all together from different genres. Um, and the idea is to weave a tapestry, you know, and to really take, it's, it's old school radio, to take the listener on a journey. So there's this two-way street that I learned mm. that even though I had the microphone, my job is to make you feel like you have a voice, right? Right. Which is exactly what good marketing is, right? And so th the other thing that was really key was I learned about the neuroscience of music and how, mm. why, what I specifically doing was working, was working. And I'll, I'll bet, I'll tell you two stories quickly. The last radio, before I went to XM, I was um, in North Carolina at this great little AAA station. They were starting in a place where it was all country and, you know, top 40 and all that. We used to have m meetings at a strip club. I, <laughs> disgusting, <laughs> like the South. Oh okay. Goodness. Cause that's what the owners, they, we were weird. These, this little station, you know, we were the weirdos. He, they, for Christmas, the owner got me two books, Gone with the Wind and a uh, biography of Leonard Skinnerd, and said, we'll make a Southern girl out of you yet. And I said, <laughs> fuck that. <laughs> right. Like, who are these people? So when I was there, I, I left and uh, in a few months and I, and I went to XM and the, my boss called me and said, Hey, the book's out. The Arbitron book is out, the ratings book and you're number one. And I was in evenings. Woo! Yes. Evenings in AAA unheard of. Like, so normal AAA, uh, this format, you know, in regular radio, we're in the twenties, 20, 20, 20 most listened to stations. Right. So evenings also really rare. And he's like, what did you do? And I said, I threw out your playlist. Cause I did. And it was the me show because I was the production director. I had designed the commercials and I had voiced and designed all of the imaging, the drops that identified the station. Oh. Right. And I learned to leave in mistakes on purpose or make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I learned, you know, my radio voice is, is a little bit different than this voice, Alice. It's a little smoother. Right. Yeah. You know? But I learned not to make it too smooth. Um, and <laughs> when I, and I, so I, I kind of knew that I was doing all those things, but I didn't understand the science behind it. And then I started doing some research. So when your brain listens to, mm. and this is, this fuels Lately's AI, which is why it's relevant. Um, so when your brain listens to a new song, Alice, you must instantly access every other song that you ever heard before. This is what's happening inside here. And it's looking for familiar touch points. So it knows where okay. to index that new song in the library of the memory of your brain here. And in that moment comes forth nostalgia and memory, emotion, all the things that cue trust, which is why we buy. Yeah. Right. Now, yeah, right. your voice, Alice, is a song. There's a frequency. You have a note there. So when you write text and I read it, I hear your voice in my head. And it's your job as the author to give me familiar touch points that cue nostalgia, memory, emotion, yeah. trust. It all ties in. Wow. <laughs> I think everybody listening to this, every CEO out there needs to share this with their team because I think what's missing is that understanding, right? And when salespeople are trying to talk to people that they don't know, they're being so robotic or formal or whatever they're being, they think they're being communicative, but they're not because they're not thinking about their own voice and the person who's listening and what that person needs to hear to connect the dots. Like you were saying with the music, people listen to that new piece and try to integrate it. Yeah. What does this sound like that I've heard before there you go. Where's this in my library? And if I'm sending you a message as a sales or marketer, you know, I'm sending you the buyer a message that you can't integrate and it doesn't fit anywhere. You're just going to tune it out. It's like, Ooh, this is icky. I can't like integrate it. It's like scratching your nails <laughs> on a chalkboard. Get rid of it. Right. That's not music. That's not music to my ears, my buying ears. Right. So I, I think that's such a helpful way to explain what we're trying to do and why what we're doing just simply isn't working. Yeah. Cause we're so skipping to the sale. We're forgetting the, the connection part. Right. It's like you went straight to buy this stuff from me. Right. And, um, I think Steve was so brilliant to see that you had, a method behind your madness, right? And you had this feeling and you knew intuitively, but then 
you did the research to back it up. So you believed yourself. It's like, I was doing this and it's working, but now I believe it because <laughs> I understood why it was working. And now I can take this forward and use the same type of understanding of the way humans process and fit things in to give them a language words that will help them want to buy. And Steve saw that where you were like, oh, how is it? It's just a spreadsheet. Like, uh, yeah. Huh. So, so lucky you and lucky him and lucky your other co-founders uh, that you, that he no- noticed that and said, this is something. And then you believed and you all believe yep. that this is something. And now you see for real after seven years that it is absolutely something that everybody needs. So you guys started this company. Yes. And there you went. And then all of a sudden, now you have to sell something. Yep. (laughs) And so how did that work out? Who did the selling? Who did you go to? And how did you start to build sales? It was hard and not easy because I have done sales in the past and I am really good at it, but I don't like it. I'm a product person. I'm a marketer. That's, That's where my sweet spot is. And also as the CEO, like I'm a marketing CEO. Right. So a lot of right. CEOs are the sales CEO, but this is my strengths lie somewhere else. And, you know, so we kept trying to hire someone to be run the sales department. And like everybody else, we. Right. Because your co-founders were all tech guys, right? They were right. all the tech guys, the build it guys. Yeah. Not, no, yeah. Nothing at all. Right. About sales. They're great. Great guys. Um, and <laughs> they're so funny. I remember being like at a mixer with them and literally saying, you guys have to leave the conversation before it's over. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> when, when the last word happens, don't just stare at people. Like, well, walk away. <laughs> <It's> so funny. <laughs> so, you know, we, um, we, we hired people who, and I'm glad every, every, every mistake we made is, is valuable, right? So, and Mark Roberge actually helped me identify the biggest mistake we were making, which is we kept hiring salespeople to sell and manage at the same time. Ah, uh, can't yeah. do that. Yeah, I, no, can't do that. And I didn't understand that because I can run marketing and be the marketer at the same time. Right. You know? Right. So that was a huge, I was like, oh, no wonder it wasn't working. Um, because the, a, a, a wild horse doesn't want to sit in the office, you know? Right. Okay. No. <laughs> so I get that. And then the other problem, though, that we had, Alice, was we kept trying to do what everybody said we should do. Because, you know, typical SaaS companies do, do two things. They either pour a bunch of money into paid ads yes. or they set up a bank of SDRs, smile and dial all day. Right. right? Island. So we hate that on the receiving end as a company. We hate, we hate, right. That. And it just didn't feel, we even experimented with it. It didn't feel right to us. No. And it was a long time before we just. Said, and good for you for recognizing that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much because it, and it, it occurred to me that the SAS needs to evolve, right? This yeah. old way isn't working anymore. Right. And so I've been crazy enough to prove it, 98% sales conversion. I got other wrong, there's no doubt about it, but not on the front end, right? (laughs) And there were some signs, like, so Lauren, who came in um, and ran our customer service, she was outselling every sales gun we ever hired by three to one. You want to know why? Because she's a nice person. Yeah. Yeah. And not that your sales per- people weren't nice, but they probably weren't being nice or trying to go pressure people into buying something because that's what they right. were trained to do. That's to right. No fault of their own. This is what always makes me feel terrible. Right. It's like you're blaming the salespeople, but wait a minute, you're the ones who trained them to do that and taught them and taught them and expect them to do that. So they're out pushing, right? And, but customer success just is trying to help. They're just trying, trying to, to be nice. And it's amazing. Um, someone that you should know, and I, I'd be happy to introduce you, is my good friend John Ferrar, who started. Oh, Google. I know John. He's amazing. And before that, he started Goldmine. He's amazing. He doesn't have a single salesperson in his organization. Right? I didn't they know that. They sell through resellers, and they have all customer success people who are because they do a find, yeah. try, buy model, and the customer success people just help them convert to get what they need. He's a it's genius. Awesome. So. I love that you're saying, oh my gosh, I recognize that this customer success person was selling more than the salespeople. Yeah. And she did it in a way too, where there wasn't a clash. So, so that's the other thing we found out too, is I've had a couple of salespeople, you know, start and say, we're going to, you and I are going to clash a lot. We're going to have a lot of arguments. And I'm like, 
I don't do that with anybody on my team. I don't have time for any drama whatsoever. And so that's a tough thing too, because I'm, I am on the cover of my magazine that I'm selling and I'm happy to put other people on the cover too. Actually, I don't mind sharing that, but I am still the boss. I mean, I yes. am. And so that's the other thing we've had to watch out for is like, cause, cause a lot of salespeople, like I said, they're, they're amazing at what they do, but they, they, you know, they need a little more um, glitz than I'm willing to share. <laughs> to be honest, right? Yeah. And, and there's good reason around that. It's not because I'm egotistic. It's because this is a way, this is the way this ship works. You know, I still have yes. to raise the money and I have to be, bring you to a fundraising call with me. And in those meetings, they need to see me as the leader in control, right? There's, right. as I've learned <laughs> the hard, very right. hard way. That's right. So we've been shifting. Um, so we did demos requests only for a long time mm -hmm. and we learned and that was so great. And now we're shifting to a full self-service model, um, which is crazy, Alice. For the first time in our lives, we are ignoring the MRR and thinking, all right, <laughs> whatever, because it's not my okay. KPI. Mark taught me this too. It's not my KPI. My KPI is what is the thing that makes you not leave? Right. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a major mindset. I'm terrified. <laughs> I haven't prayed more for a long time. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're really excited. We're about to release this inside out thing um, in t two or three weeks, I think. So you'll see. I cannot wait to see what's coming next because you guys have just been doing so great all along this journey. And I love this self-serve model. Why not? If you have a product that can, you know, let people buy it, right? And I think that all the research is telling us that buyers want a seller-free experience. Why? Because sellers aren't helping them buy. If sellers were helping them buy, they wouldn't want a buyer-free experience. Now, I, I recognize fully that there are some things that just you have to have people involved to be able to purchase them. Right. Got it. They're very complex and, you know, it's just not going to happen without some humans interacting, call them salespeople or whatever you want to call them. People who have information to help you buy are going to be there. But in every case where we can help them make part of the decision without a human by reading, by learning, by watching, and then in any case where we can allow them to buy on their own terms, it's just lovely because that's what people want to do. It is. Yeah. And it took us a long time to be able to do it and to create a product that would functionally allow that. And this is, this is the aha we've had this year. So, um, and, and it, the best part is the whole team is working in a way that we've never worked before because we feel that suddenly all of our skill sets are back in the right arenas, you know? Yeah. Um, and so we're smiling, which is, you know, we cry a lot. So <laughs> this feels good. <laughs> <laughs> smiling is good. Oh my gosh. Well, I have to get you on your way because I know that um, you've got another meeting to go to and I could talk to you for hours, but what I'm going to ask is that you'll come back on the show with me, maybe six months from now and tell me how this has all worked. And, you know, hopefully it'll be a huge success, which I'm sure it will be. But I know that all of our listeners, the CEOs out there are, are going to be really curious to find out how this goes. Um, Kate, thank you so much. And everyone out there, if you have not checked out lately, please do it right now because I'm telling you, your team needs it. Uh, so thank you, Kate. It's just been delightful. Um, thanks for sharing with us. And we will definitely have to come back to this story. I love that. Thank you. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And we'll see you next week.